So three days have passed, and most of you are still here, one left. <laughs> Get you over the critical point. Now the, the I've been using these time to just encourage a attitude of interest and relaxation uh, for the first three days of just being patient with yourself and with what happens here. Mm-hmm. Calm down, and so so now there's a level of calmness, or some people are more kind of. Uh, getting used to the situation living here at this retreat center at Amravati. So this is the way life. It takes a while to to get used to some place, doesn't it? it we uh, we can't just we go to we can move around quite a bit, but it takes a while to feel a sense of kind of fitting in or being accustomed to it. At first, uh, a meditation retreat, there's probably, if you've never been on one, then there are probably all kinds of of, uh, fears or anticipations. and It's the whole form is strange. Buddhism itself, the bowing, the chanting, the whole kind of... uh, thing that, that one sees, Buddhist monks, shaven heads, Buddhist nuns. It's uh, Some people feel just totally kind of bewildered or uh, don't quite know how to relate to it because it is, it is a tradition that it is different than, than say what say most people in this part of the world are used to or have any, any real uh, experience with. Being a Buddhist monk for 25 years, it all seems just terribly ordinary to me. So, <laughs> so sometimes I forget that it's not for others. Like, why, why are they getting so upset by bowing? And it seems so ordinary, an ordinary thing to do. It, I remember years ago when I went to Thailand and saw bowing and then had to bow the first time. It was really quite a quite a, a hard experience for me. Bowing is something we just we just don't do in the European or part of the world. So one feel doesn't one feels so kind of strange with it. Now the the uh, vipassana meditation. Vipassana means uh, insight. It's always the looking at or going deeply into something. So the the tranquility meditation is samatha, where we where we concentrate the mind on an object, like the breath. We we sustain, hold our attention onto to an object. Uh, that we, that there are many different possible objects, but the one that we generally use uh, is the mindfulness of the breath, concentration on the breath. So, in order to concentrate on the breath, then uh, if you stay, if you actually uh, absorb or absorb your attention, sustain your attention long enough on your own breathing, then you will feel very tranquil. And the breathing becomes more and more refined. At first, it might be rather coarse, and then, as you concentrate more and more, you find the breath almost disappearing. Like sometimes it's hardly, 
hardly noticeable, almost like it's gone. Some people get rather frightened at that moment. They think, I'll stop breathing. They think, but don't worry, you're all right. Nobody's ever died doing anapanasati. (laughs) Not in 2,534 years. Maybe you'll be the first. But breathing becomes very subtle as, as the mind concentrates and, and very refined. And, but th- that's not what we want, is refinement or subtlety in, in, in vipassana. We're looking, uh, vipassana is investigation and looking at the way things are, investigating the Four Noble Truths, applying that teaching of the Four Noble Truths to uh, oneself, one's own experience. So it's not just a a doctrine that we believe, but it's a teaching that that we take and apply it to what's happening to ourselves. So the first noble truth then is the truth of of dukkha or suffering, or suffering is not really, uh, uh, doesn't convey the the range of, of dukkha, uh, uh, dukkha it means what we can't bear and the actual literal translation uh, from Pali it uh, it implies uh, imperfection, unsatisfactoriness but just for convenience we use the word suffering we have to expand the English word suffering to mean more than it generally means um, or we can take the word dukkha itself and, and, and use it in the English context. But n- now these are truths, they're noble truths, they're not absolute truths. Now this is important because uh, we, we, when we approach religion we tend to think in terms of absolutes or metaphysical doctrines where in uh, Theravada Buddhism the emphasis on on noble truths rather than metaphysical doctrines. So these truths are not metaphysical truths. There's nothing metaphysical about suffering. Suffering is existential. It's it's what we experience. Each one experiences suffering. There's always a certain amount of suffering in any, any being's life. That is just the way it is. It's not, you know, it's not, no matter how privileged or wealthy you might be or how underprivileged and poverty stricken you might be, there's suffering. Suffering is a common strand to all human experience, whether it's in Asia or Europe or America, Africa, from the ancient time pre-Buddhist to the present moment. It is, uh, it's the, the attitude we generally take to suffering is that I suffer when we have pain or when we feel despair or, or anguish or depression. We say, I'm suffering, I, I am depressed. So suffering, the experience of suffering is always a, in uh, interpreted from the I am position. Now I am is is something you should reflect upon. This this sense of I am, the, this that those two words, the pronoun and the verb together, uh, that is instilled in the mind, isn't it? That's language, and that that sense of I am is. Uh, is then taken to interpret all experience. So in the, we, everything becomes related to a sense of I as a, as a person, as a separate being. So suffering is generally uh, seen in that way. Uh, we, have, we, we see suffering as always on, on this highly personal level of why do I have to suffer? Why, what's wrong with me? Or or if you're 
someone who believes the world is persecuting you, that it's others who are making you suffer. Maybe it's the society. Uh, maybe it's your your partner or your children or whatever. Or maybe it's uh, it's that you're that you're suffering because there's something wrong with there's something wrong with you. But in the first noble truth, it's worded in this sense: there is suffering. It's a it's a statement. It's not saying there is only suffering. Or suffering is ultimate reality. Or uh, so it's not a doctrine, is it? It's a it's a reflective teaching. It's pointing to something. It's saying there is suffering. Look, look, see if you can find suffering. So this this uh, way of of referring to suffering is most important because, like, when you experience uh, discomfort, pain, or emotional suffering of any sort, instead of seeing that I'm suffering and I'm feeling bad and I'm this way and and it's because of this and that, uh, it's, it's more skillful to reflect that there is this suffering, there is this feeling of despair or there is this physical discomfort. Just, just thinking in these terms helps enormously to, to put it in a different, to give it a different uh, kind of quality. If you interpret discomfort, pain, depression, everything, always from the I am position, there's so many associations and and mental proliferations from from I am. And then it just I am, and then the mind just zooms on into conceptual proliferations. But in reflecting on this first noble truth, there is suffering. It's it's a recognition of suffering, but it's not it's but it's taking the person out of it. There is pain in the body. There is uh, maybe anguish in the heart. There is grief. There is uh, uh, sorrow. There is a uh, sense of fear or anxiety. There is jealousy. There is anger or there is greed. Rather than I'm greedy, I'm angry, I'm jealous, I'm frightened, I am, I am, I am, I am. But when we when we interpret it, uh, I'm I'm angry, then then the mind goes into I'm angry. Here I go again, getting angry. I shouldn't shouldn't be angry, or or I should be more patient. I and uh, I, I try to not be angry, but I still get angry, and and it goes on into a, a guilt and remorse and blame and a whole kind of uh, cycle uh, occurs that goes around. So what I advise you to do uh, during this retreat is to frame your experiences of suffering. Take the person out of them and just kind of look at it as there is this feeling. There is this feeling of of anger. There is this feeling of of, uh, despair. There is this painful feeling in the body. There is dukkha, in other words. So that then you're then you're then you're uh, beginning to awaken to the first noble truth of the Buddhist teaching. Now suffering then is something that uh, there's there's the natural unsatisfactoriness of our state that that is just the way it is, isn't it? Like the aging, old age, sickness, and death. This is just a part of natural law. This is not personal, isn't it? Anything that all human beings they're born and they they get old and they get sick and they die. This is just the way it is. This is not. There. This is just nature. This is natural. This is the Dhamma. What is born is like this. It, it it arises and then ceases. But then the conceptual proliferation is: I'm getting old. I'm sick, and I'm going to die. And, 
And therefore, it's taken out of its proper context uh, as, as a natural experience towards giving the sense of, of I am I am an old person or I am a sick person. I am a I am go- I'm a person who's going to die. And so this this sense of I am is uh, is used for for what is natural and what happens according to natural laws and the flow of life. If taken on a personal level, gives us a lot of fears and anxieties, worries, resentments. How many of you resent? Aging, the aging process. Very common, isn't it? To resent the hair turning gray. To resent wrinkles in the face. To resent the loss of vigor. To resent the... It's not fair, is it? And, and the whole natural process is looked at as an attack on me. Which is vanity, isn't it? I I don't want the I don't want the natural laws to be this way. I want the natural laws to make an exception for me. And that people have tried, you know, the, desperately to to resist, but it, inevitably just the, everyone has to submit to this. So we might as well submit to it with wisdom and graciousness and uh, and good humor rather than than. Uh, making our lives miserable over what is just normal, natural way of things. Suffering should be understood. Now for each noble truth there is three three insights. And uh, Theravada Buddhism is, is a it, to people that don't understand it very well, it looks like it has these lists of things. Everything is 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 kind of it's like a computerized religion. It's uh, everything is there's a five of this and the four of that and the six of this and the seven of that and and so the it it lo- it looks like an inventory. Uh, and so when people sometimes uh, think it lacks inspiration because of it, it's not inspiring, is it, to have four of this and six of that. <coughs> the four persons, the eight kinds of noble beings. <laughs> and the, uh, uh, but, the, but as a reflective teaching, it works very well because when you have it ordered in that way, then these lists are are really quite quite uh, helpful as taking these these lists in the in the Theravada school and Pali Canon and and applying them to they help you to to kind of look at things in a certain way. So it is not meant to to inspire the mind. I mean, if you want inspiration, you read the Dhammapada. Uh, but if you are practicing vipassana, you go to these lists, and they they kind of help you to, uh, to to contemplate and reflect upon uh, your own experience, your own feeling, the feelings in the body and the and the, the mental states in a way that you would probably never think of if you didn't have such lists. So the three three insights into the first noble truth. Notice it's it's a statement of there is then the second noble truth tells you you should understand <coughs> suffering or suffering should be understood. And then the third insight into the first noble truth is suffering has been understood. So it is, it is that, that formula of stating, making the statement, the thesis and then the, making the, the statement itself and then, and then the, then the, uh, what you should do, your mode of operation, and then, then your, uh, then the insight, the result of doing that. So in in uh, in the statement, there is suffering. Suffering should be understood. You, you, what to understand suffering means you have to look at it. You have to admit it. 
it's not an abstract suffering we're talking about, you know, kind of vague suffering out there, but but suffering is in in the nitty gritty bits of daily life. It's the feeling of of being annoyed or being slightly irritated or feeling down or being angry what it from from just little bits of irritation and frustration to great passions should be understood so we this means we suffering should be so that means we look at suffering to understand suffering you have to stand under it to stand under it means you you, you accept it whatever it is you accept the suffering you're not just reacting to it because usually we don't accept suffering, we react to it. If, if something unpleasant happens, we, I don't want this. I, I don't, it's not fair. So it's a reaction against suffering, usually that human beings uh, have, rather than an understanding of it. So suffer, there is suffering, suffering should be understood. And then by looking, by accepting suffering, the dukkha, then there's the insight. Suffering has been understood. We've accepted this suffering. There is suffering, yes. Suffering is like this. It's this way. So the these this this pattern uh, uh, applies to all four noble truths. The statement, then the then the uh, what to do about it, and then the result of having practiced and having and done what what you were told to do. Suffering seen as unsatisfactoriness, just how uh, you know things are. Basically, you know, in the in the uh, things are changing so that nothing you can't find any kind of uh, permanence or real stability in in things that change. So we're always sometimes you know we feel we tend to to expect satisfaction from what is what is basically unsatisfactory. Uh, we put all our hopes maybe in a relationship with somebody or in having our own house or in a profession or whatever, and then we. Then when it changes, or it, it, the house burns down, or the, the relationship falls apart, or the partner dies, or, or whatever, the way it changes, we feel uh, somehow that bereft and, and, and upset and lost because we haven't really understood suffering yet. We've, we've expected that, that somehow there's this, uh, we, have, we can assume that when we have what we want, then we will be that that will be satisfactory to us. When I was a child, I remember a little boy. I was seeing this toy in the in a in a shop window, and I wanted this toy more than anything. So. I went to my mother and I said, uh, "I want, I want this toy." And uh, she wasn't very receptive to my request, and so I kept kind of nagging her, and you know how children do to their mothers, and uh, kept at her until uh, I said, "You know, I promise. I said, if I have this toy, I'll never want anything ever again." <laughs> and I meant it. I, at that age, you know, I was innocent. So I, I thought that the only thing that kept me from being really happy was that I didn't have this toy that I wanted. And I actually thought that once I get it, I will be happy forevermore. I'll never want anything ever again. So she went and she bought the toy and gave it to me. And then I decided I wanted something else. <laughs> And I <laughs> but it was an insight because I remember vividly how that that there was one, you know, the innocent side that that moment thought that if I have this, 
you know, as a, as a small child, you, you, you don't have a, you, you're not sophisticated, you have no experience. So you, this was one of my first experiences with being, <coughs> with dukkha, was, was thinking that if I get this one thing that I want so much, that I was obsessed with, then then I would live happily ever after with it. I would never want anything again. I'd never ask my mother for anything ever again if she just get this one thing for me. And then when I got it, I think I played with it for about five minutes. And somehow it was a, like an anticlimax, wasn't it? I got it, it was, I, got, I had the, the, the happiness that you get from getting what you want. Oh, I got it at last. Yippee! And then you play with it for a while and you get bored. Where the actual promise of getting it was, you know, went on for days. You know, this anticipation, if I could only get this, and I kept at her, you know, pushing her like children do, till she finally gave in out of, just for a few moments, peace. So sometimes that, those are the assumptions we have, is, is that we, we think that when we, when we meet the right person, relationships, that will, that will be it, then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be fulfilled. Well, somebody else will come along and fulfill me. It's in, the, you know, like Cinderella and Prince Charming, or you read it in the romantic novels. It's, uh, what's wrong with me is that I'm, I need somebody to come along and, and the other half of me to fulfill me. Or the, and, and that always ends up with disillusionment, doesn't it? Nobody can fulfill us. Because we're expecting somebody to, 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 uh, to make us permanently happy. It's like the toy, isn't it? It's a, it's a nice idea. You think that all I need is someone else to come along and make me happy all the time. But yet, but yet, can anyone, do we have the right to expect any other person to spend their life making me happy? Isn't that silly, isn't it? That, you, you know, I'm, I, that I should think that somebody else should devote their life to making me happy all the time. That's asking too much. And yet, sometimes that's what we assume, that the, the person that we meet should spend their life, should fulfill me and make me happy and, and not let me suffer. So it's like the toys. Once we get that person, then we'll live happily ever after, but it's not the way it is. There's still suffering. I remember in uh, me, this friend of mine in, in the university, he was... He was uh, working on his PhD, and he thought, he said to me one time, he says, once I get this PhD, that's it. I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a nervous wreck now. I'm really, you know, my mind is a mess. But once I get this PhD, then that, I'll be really happy, you know, and, and I'm not going to, you know, I'll, I'll never be like this again. It's just this, you know, this studying and worrying and passing exams and but once I get it, then I'll have my PhD. I'll be at the top. That's it. I'll be, I'll be live in this state of maybe permanent bliss forevermore. So he, when he received his PhD, I met him a week later, and he was in the same terrible state. Of, I don't know what to do next. Whether I should go off to Cornell or Columbia, or <laughs> and do further studies and. And though the, the whole habit, uh, you know, the expectation of getting the, the PhD, or maybe buying the house, or the perfect house, the dream house, or, or making it in your profession, or becoming a success in some way as an artist or politician, and that all these things have, you know, we, we can invest so much hope, anticipation, expectation, and yet the result, if we, if we should get all that we wanted, would be still this sense of dukkha, unsatisfactoriness. Even winning is, unsatisf is not satisfactory, is it? 
to to be praised and to be a winner and to to uh, get what we want. There's still the, the the moment maybe of happiness, but then there's the 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 habit is established of always of wanting something more. So suffering is due to wanting things. The attachment to desires. So in the first noble truth, we're just admitting that there is suffering. Some people don't even admit there's suffering. Or they don't, they think it's, they, they kind of overlook it or ignore it. They don't, they don't understand it. They don't accept it and, and uh, study it and learn from it. They can just react or run away from anything that seems miserable or unpleasant. That's why in, say, in just physical uh, sensation, we go to the actual pain, uh, not as a kind of aggressive act, but as a way of, of looking at, at something that you don't like to be able to understand it, to stand under the pain or the itch or the irritation or in the discomfort. Not as a kind of masochistic uh, need to, to be miserable, but to, to just look at something directly that, that you've spent your life running away from or, or rejecting or reacting to. Old age is is unsatisfying. I mean, the aging process, isn't it? When we, especially when we, the whole the, is is a to identify with the aging process of the body is suffering. But the aging process, when seen as dhamma or the way it is, then there's no suffering. We don't create suffering around the age of our body when we see it as Dhamma or the way it is. But we do create suffering when we think it's ours. When when the body's sick or in pain, if we see it in the way of Dhamma, then there's no suffering. But when we see it as I'm sick, then there's suffering. Now this I've, I've, I've experimented with. Like in Thailand I had... Uh, Malaria quite badly for a year, and uh, and at first I suffered a lot from malaria. I created a lot of suffering around having malaria, uh, and it's quite. It seemed to be a very unpleasant. It was a frightening disease. You heard a terrible story that it would go to your brain and you could die, and and uh, and it was quite unpleasant. And it, it kept reoccurring for a year, just over and over again attacks of malaria and when I first had it I was um, I'd been practicing meditation very diligently but I felt so weak with this malaria that I couldn't meditate the way that I had been doing you see so uh, Ajahn Chah came to see me at that time I was at a different I was at a branch monastery and he came to that branch to see me and I said, I can't meditate anymore. I feel so weak and sick. And, and so he said, Well, that's your meditation. Meditate on on the on the malaria. So I started just contemplating and reflecting on the just the feelings of the kind of fevers or the chills or the sensations. Or I began to just observe, reflect on my own mental state of how I wanted to get rid of this disease. How I it frightened me. I I I was afraid it might do something like cause permanent damage. I was afraid I might die. Uh, I I want I wanted to get some medicines that would just knock it out, get rid of it immediately. And then I began to see the suffering really wasn't the malaria, but the the desire to get rid of it. When I began to to uh, to uh, really bear the sensations of it, I found out they weren't all that bad. Some of them were, were quite all right, in fact. Some of the fevers, and they had their 
things like this were something I could bear. It wasn't wasn't anything I couldn't stand. Uh, it wasn't all that. It wasn't as bad as I thought. And that uh, that uh, their suffering wasn't because of malaria. It was the suffering then was. I didn't want this malaria. I was frightened by it. I was reacting to it. So when I began to accept it and just and the the actual sensations and the condition itself, there was no suffering. There were still malarial fevers and things like that, but but there were I did not create suffering around it. So that was quite an insight into 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 Dhamma, isn't it? Because I, mean, I could see firsthand that 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 all these things one can bear. They needn't be forms of suffering for us if we see them in the right way. If we understand them as they are, then we do not suffer. So old age, sickness, death, the, we needn't suffer from these experiences. Because the, when we see them in the right way, then they are what they are. But we don't create, we don't compound them with desires, with fears. So to know that difference makes a lot of difference in, in how one relates to life in general. Because... If we don't know that simple truth, there is suffering. Suffering should be understood and and then understand suffering. We can live our lives always with a sense that there shouldn't be suffering or that suffering shouldn't be here and that I'm suffering and I don't want to suffer. And suffering is caused by you because you, you aren't making me happy anymore or suffering... Is, is because there's something wrong with me, because I'm something inadequate about me, and if I were normal or healthy person, I wouldn't suffer like I do, because I'm, uh, you know, something wrong with me. So there's uh, those two, and blaming yourself or blaming someone else. There's the, the, the that, uh, desire to, to just avoid anything that, that looks like suffering, to turn away, to just run away from it. But reflecting on Dhamma, we see that, that the, the nature of this realm, the sensory realm, is, is this, it's a sensitive realm. Sensitivity means that we're going to experience pleasure and pain. That's what sen- being sensitive is all about. Sensu- sensitive, sensual experience. Sense organs. And that we have eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body. We have a, a, a brain. We have a mind. We have, uh, we have a retentive memory. We have emotions, we feel things, we love and hate, we like and dislike things, we have desires and fears and so forth. And so the, 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 uh, this, this realm of sensitivity is, is like this. It's all, all our whole life span from birth to death is an experience of sensitivity. Something's always happening to us, isn't it? Impinging on us. The temperature is too hot, too cold, just right, or, or uh, pleasure, pain, beauty and ugliness, beautiful sounds, pleasant, melodious sounds, or cacophonous ones, uh, fragrant odors, or, or stenches, or uh, just uh, good thoughts and bad thoughts, happy t- memories or miserable memories. Uh, we, can, we have to look at things that are, are, that are horrible sometimes. Seeing misery around us. Seeing, uh, like, a, a, you know, you, you, you talk to people who've lived in, in places like Cambodia during the, when the time when the Pol Pot was, uh, 
destroying his own people. Some of the Cambodians have had to look at the most horrific things that you can imagine, watching their mothers being murdered or their fathers or husbands or whatever. Having to look at brutality and ugliness. This is sensitive. This is what being sensitive is about. Sometimes we don't want to be sensitive. We'd like to not know, not feel, not experience anything. I've heard in, uh, about the, uh, what is it, post-traumatic syndrome from the Gulf War, where the British troops coming back from the Gulf War suffering this kind of what they call post-traumatic syndrome, where they, they've been exposed to a lot of violence and exciting activities in, in, uh, in Iraq. And the young young boys, usually 18, 19 year old British men who sent off you know, normal blokes, sent off to this gulf for this very brief war, where they see and experience violence and brutality and and the killing and slaughter, and they have to witness this, and they're they're probably involved in it and doing it. And then they have to come back to Wales or Northern Scotland <laughs> and fit into a society that's not never done any of those things and doesn't has never seen what they've seen. Or we have the Vietnam veteran in America where the, these men still kind of so many of them lost, not knowing what to do because during their youth they had they saw and witnessed and participated in hideous activities or violence or exci- ex- extreme excitement so sensitivity is is i mean when we take it to to such extremes it it overwhelms us but this is what being born on the, in, as a human being is about is in this state of sensitivity till death, from birth to death. Some people spend their lives trying to make themselves insensitive. What kind of blinkered vision. Just keep the door shut. I don't want to know. Don't don't tell me anything. Just just say everything's okay. Uh, and I don't want to feel anything. I don't want to get involved with anything where, I'm, where my feelings might be hurt or where I'll feel anything very much. Uh, we can be so frightened and so timid and so uh, intimidated by our sensitivity that we become insensitive or cowardly, frightened beings. But in uh, practice of Dhamma, we open to this sensitivity totally. We become, we're willing to be totally sensitive. The idea of understanding suffering then is to allow yourself to feel totally and to feel pain, to feel despair, to feel all these things that we tend to try to avoid or, or repress. So we're not picking and choosing. We're not, I'm only going to feel happiness. The, 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 the first noble truth is not there is happiness, it is there is suffering. So suffering should be understood. Happiness is what we like, so that's what we try to get, isn't it? We'd like we would like to live. How many of people pray to God to give them all the best? Dear God up in heaven, please give me good health and, and not let anything bad happen to me, and make lots of money and and be a success and. All my friends live, my mother and father and my wife and husband and children, they all be happy and well and, and may we, until I die, may I live in a state of bliss, perpetual bliss, happiness, security and give me all the best. Don't let me, don't ever give me any of like sickness or cancer. Don't ever let me have cancer or anything like that. And don't let any of my friends or anything die before I do and and I just, 
please, Almighty up in heaven, protect me from misery. Don't let me experience any form of suffering whatsoever. Is what? Is the is a selfish uh, kind of silly, foolish demand. Because life is this way. Sensitivity is is to we to learn from it, not to run away from it. And we can learn from it. That's our, that's that's the the message of the Buddha. We we can understand suffering. And through understanding suffering, we don't suffer. But if we refuse to understand suffering, we are definitely going to suffer a lot. In a kind of dumb way, isn't it? Kind of, I don't know what's happened to me, uh, kind of way. It's not fair. And, and, and the bitterness, resentments of a lifetime totally dedicated to resistance, refusal to look at anything that's painful or unpleasant, and avoiding issues, leads you to what? An age, old age that is miserable and, and uh, depressing and frightening. Death is a frightening thing. So in meditation, don't, don't think that meditation is going to get you out of suffering. You meditate and go into some blissful state and never get out of it. But blissful states are come and go. They're unsatisfactory. Blissful, uh, any, any bliss, any highs you get out of meditation, they're all suffering in the sense that they they are impermanent. And if you expect permanent bliss out of meditation, then you're going to be very disappointed. So in Vipassana meditation, you're 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 not you're not trying to just go into blissful states anymore. You're willing to look at what's happening. We don't we don't have to go onto the killing fields of Cambodia. Or anything like that to suffer. We, you know, we enough suffering, just sitting here on this mat, for enlightenment. <laughs> Don't think you have to, <laughs> to experience uh, the most horrendous forms of suffering. If we just learn from the suffering that we have, before it is, before it goes into extremes, then, then when any extreme forms come, we can we can also. We, that, that will not be a, that will be will be prepared to use that uh, any for extreme form of suffering. Birth then, being born as a human being, means that we're thrown into this realm, this sensory realm as an individual, as a sen- sensitive individual, isn't it? From birth to death. We have to, whatever happens to, to this, whatever impinges upon this form, we have to, w- that we're going to feel that. Some of it's going to be pleasant, some of it painful, some neutral. So in reflection on it, we are observing the, the sensation of it, the, the Vedana or the feeling, the pleasure, the neutrality or the, 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 the displeasure or the pain. That we can do, we can observe, we can witness to feeling, pleasure and pain. We can see that pleasure and pain arises and ceases. There's no permanent pleasure no, or no permanent pain. <coughs> but, and in this state that we're in of being a conscious and sensitive human being is that we, we then uh, can uh, use whatever happens, whatever impinges on us for that kind of understanding, understanding of suffering.
So this then allows us to, to not to be frightened of our sensitivity or of life or all the possibilities of that, that we can think of. Right now we're sitting here in a fairly safe place and, uh, but we can think of, uh, you know, possibilities of, in the future of all forms of suffering, getting cancer, getting terrible diseases, getting, losing our loved ones, um, being hit by a car, being, having a heart attack, having a brain hemorrhage, having all our teeth pulled out, and being attacked by somebody else, or being, all our things being taken away from us, or being, persecuted or tortured or whatever these we can we can think of all you know the most extreme forms of misery and pain that we could experience before we die and when we think about that then we we become frightened because we know that that anything's possible in this state we're in that anything you can think of is possible being uh, trampled over by an elephant possible not very likely in England but in Thailand it's possible <laughs> or you know a, the, a plane from Luton Airport crash suddenly falling down on top of the retreat center that's possible but so much of suffering isn't isn't the the that kind of, of possibility because we always think, well, that might happen to somebody else. But it's the, just the, the endless niggling, uh, inadequate reactions, emotional reactions we've developed in our lives, in which, uh, through suppression and fear and desire, that we've never, re- say, allowed to, we've never liberated those, those habit tendencies. So when we meditate now, it's with the aim of liberating the mind and the heart. Not trying to get out of suffering, but liberating it from all the fears and desires that we that we harbor and we cling to and that that blind us and and cause us uh, this anxiety and worry and and fear. I like to think of meditation then as a kind of really a thing of opening up to being willing to be sensitive, willing to to suffer in whatever way. And this gives me a, 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 a sense of fearlessness. I used to be a coward before. I used to feel very frightened the possibilities of, of you know life going wrong and you know, bad things happening and not being able to cope with this and, and what will I do if this happens? How could I bear it? And what if, you know, there's this sense of if, if something goes wrong, I'll just ruin my life. And then one becomes a coward. One becomes timid and frightened of doing anything because it might fail or you, you, your life becomes just kind of, you try to circumscribe it and protect it in various ways so that that possibilities that that you can imagine have the least have least uh, entrance into your life, <coughs> but with an understanding of Dhamma, you you are fearless, because whatever happens, you use that for your your practice of understanding suffering. Whether it's a loss of loved one, loss of fortune, loss of health aging process, just the way things change, uh, whatever, whatever uh, happens to us for good or for ill, for success or for failure, for praise or blame, happiness, suffering. These are, the, these are just the worldly dhammas that, that we experience in which we, we understand rather than we try to uh, seek the positive side and run away from from the negative like we we would all like to have happiness and be praised and be successful and be a, have an important position in the society 
to be somebody important in the society, to be considered a successful person, to be happy, to be healthy, to be praised. Most of us like that, don't we? That's very nice. Somebody says, you're wonderful. It's nice to hear. <laughs> and have good health and to, to, uh, to uh, everything to go well. And to, we want Amravati to be just a perfect monastery where the monks and nuns are, are living together in perfect harmony, practicing and not causing any problems or in any kind of threats from outside. We've got to keep away. I remember one time at Chithurst, years ago, before Amaravati, we had a, a somebody come who was a very disruptive kind of person. And he started uh, causing a lot of problems in the monastic community at Chithurst. And he, uh, he, was, he, was, he was a bit nutty, actually, but he had very kind of charismatic qualities. And... and uh, and could be very compelling. So there are certain people attracted to this man, and others that n- just hated him and felt very threatened by him. And so I was a head monk there, and so I was. Uh, people would come to me and say, "You've got to get rid of him. You've got to tell him to go today." He's just, he's, he, you know, he. We, we can't allow people like this in our monastery. We've got to get rid of him. And then I thought, and I, and then I get, yes, I've got to get rid of him. Yes, 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 yes. Because I wanted to get rid of him. He was disruptive and causing problems. So then, uh, then I thought, but if I get rid of him, just like that, and I could just say, get out, we don't want the likes of you here. If I did that, then all these people that had attached to him would go with him. <laughs> so I thought, no, I better not do that because because this isn't the right thing to do at this time, you know. If I, you know, I'll just make it worse. So I decided to just be patient. So, so then this went on for quite a while, and uh, it was the community became very divided. And it, but after a while, those ones that attached to him began to see. Well, he's he's a bit odd, or there's something not quite right about this man, and. And their, their kind of commitment to him began to lessen. Uh, and, and so they, they were beginning to lose interest in him. And then the ones who said, get him out of here, we don't want him around, began to get used to having him around, not make such a problem about it. And then suddenly, see, he, was a, he was American, suddenly this miracle happened. The British Home Office came one day. <laughs> And they said, do you have this, this man here? And they said, yes. They said, well, he's, he's entered Britain illegally. He has to leave. <laughs> well, take him away. <laughs> <laughs> so the Home Office came and took him away, and, and the community stayed together. So, I mean, it was uh, just <laughs> through bearing with this, this kind of difficult situation. But we all learn from it. The people that were easily taken in, the people that were immediately against, and and myself uh, having to you know make the decisions and what was in the position of of, of making decisions about this, uh, and the, so that we all learned uh, how that and sometimes uh, miracles do happen. <laughs> Never think the Home Office was a miracle, but at that moment <laughs> it was. It was the mo- it was the most appreciated kind of agency in this country to come in, and then we found out because he'd entered Britain illegally that he couldn't enter again ever. He <laughs> <laughs> went to France. <laughs> So contemplate this suffering in, uh, in in your own you know your own experience of it. Just see how how much fear and 
in how way we're, we're kind of programmed and conditioned to to resist and to suppress and to be frightened by our sensitivity. Because on a personal level, it's frightening to be sensitive. As a personality, if this is what I am, if this is me, this body, and these sense organs, and, and all this, this is what I am, then there's a lot to be frightened of, admittedly, because there is. You know, I could be beaten up, I could be you know, ostracized, blamed for something I didn't do. It, all these are possible things as a person, as an individual person. For women, isn't it? There's a lot to be frightened of, just naturally, of, of being attacked or raped. Things like this are, are very much a part of a, of a, a woman, a natural fear that women have, because it's an ever-present possibility. And as a person, this is a, this, it, it, you know, we, we can, if we take this on the personal level, then we get caught in these fears, and uh, and they 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 hang in the mind and 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 uh, oppress our conscious experience. But when we when we realize that that the, the, the that this that that this uh, that we needn't suffer from these from this, and even if the worst happens, we can we have a tremendous resilience and can bear with almost anything, uh, then we can become quite fearless. It doesn't mean to be foolish, but it means that we needn't spend our life shutting ourselves down and trying to, to hide away because we're frightened of the possibilities of being harmed. But it means we can have a measure of trust and use wisdom and understanding in our experiences of life to where we learn. We learn there is suffering, we underst- uh, that suffering should be understood, and then we understand suffering. And in that understanding, uh, which is elaborated upon in the, in the uh, Second and Third Noble Truths, uh, which we'll, we don't have time to go into this evening, uh, then there is no suffering. So ultimately, there's no suffering at all. Mm. Ultimate reality, there's no suffering. But on this, in this realm of sensitivity, there, we're, when, we, when we do not understand suffering, then we create suffering around everything. Even happiness, even beauty, like you were asking about beauty. And, and uh, we create suffering around beauty. We create suffering around love, or create suffering around success, or create suffering around even the, even the good side of life. We create suffering around it because of this ignorance and not understanding suffering. So I offer this for your reflection. <coughs>